Today in Chin Explorers, we're going to step back in time and into the fascinating world of the Aztecs, also known as the Mexica. In particular, we're going to learn about one mythological creature that was sacred to them. This dragon-like creature was called Quetzalcoatl. Later in this video, we will make a collage inspired by this god. The Aztecs were a Mesoamerican culture that flourished in central Mexico between the 14th and 16th centuries. The culture consisted of different ethnic groups from the region, including those that spoke Nahuatl. These groups were organized into city-states, bound together through alliances. Tenochtitlan was the city-state of the Aztecs and also the capital of the empire. The Aztecs did not always live in the Valley of Mexico. According to their myths and legends, their ancestors migrated from the seven sacred caves called Chico Mosto. Some researchers believe that this was an actual place, probably between 100 to 200 kilometers northeast of the Valley of Mexico. The Aztecs were forced into exile after having disagreements with other ethnic groups. Guided by the god of war, Huitzilopochtli, they started a long journey in search of their new home. They eventually found their home, an island on Lake Texcoco. And part of this story is immortalized on the Mexican flag. The eagle, the serpent and the prickly pear all represent the moment that the Aztec knew that they had arrived at their new home. Today, under the city of Mexico, are the remains of Tenochtitlan. The city was built on the western side of the lake. Lake Texcoco is the largest of five interconnected lakes. In the past, these lakes were vital to sustaining life. The ancient inhabitants practiced an agricultural technique called chinapas. These are raised beds built on water and look like artificial islands. As researcher Frederick Katz suggested, a major reason for this agricultural development is because the soil of the lake bottom is very rich. The technique has survived into the modern age, but is only practiced at a few locations. Tenochtitlan was not only an economic and mercantile centre, but was also a sacred place. As historian David Carrasco highlights, the Aztecs viewed their capital as part of a long line of sacred places, which also included the ancient city centre in the Valley of Mexico called Tehuatihuacan. The ethno-historical documents give us an important insight into what the capital once looked like. In 1519, when the Spaniards arrived at the capital, they were astounded by what they saw. For example, Sergeant Bernal Diaz Castillo wrote down his impressions of the capital. He noted that the city was accessed by a large causeway the majestic city included buildings and towers, temples, orchards and gardens, where a diverse range of plants were grown. It seemed as if the city rose straight out of the water. And as he noted, some of the soldiers, awestruck, wondered if they were in a dream. After the Spanish conquest, many buildings were dismantled and others built in their place. But thanks to the work of archaeologists and historians, we are able to reconstruct 
some places. For example, the most important Aztec temple, today known as El Templo Mayor, was dismantled and a cathedral was built in its place. The temple's location was discovered in the early 20th century. The place was finally excavated between 1978 and 1982. Importantly, the excavation discovered that the temple had been built over time and in seven stages. Pyramidal structure. The temple had two shrines. One was dedicated to Tuluk, the god of rain, and the other dedicated to Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. Quetzalcoatl was one of the most important Aztec deities. Closely related to the god of wind and to the planet Venus, Quetzalcoatl was also the patron of arts and crafts as well as knowledge. In fact, the Aztecs believed that he created books and also their calendar. The patron of priests. The god symbolized life after death. Disappearing from their world, the Aztecs believed that one day he would return. Quetzalcoatl was ancient. He had been revered by other Mesoamerican nations and groups for centuries. The Maya, for example, called him Kukulkan. In the Valley of Mexico, the earliest representations of Quetzalcoatl date back to Tehuatihuacan. At that time, he was depicted as an earth and water deity and had a close relationship with Taloc, the god of rain. A feathered serpent. His form and name were derived from animals that inhabited different parts of Mesoamerica. His name comes from two Nahuatl words. The first is Quetali, meaning the feather of the Quetzal bird. The Quetzal, a striking looking bird, has iridescent and brightly coloured feathers and a very long tail. The bird lives in clouded rainforests. The bird's feathers, along with others, were used to make ceremonial items, including elaborate headdresses worn by the Azteca elite. The second word, cuatl, means snakes. Mexico is home to hundreds of species of snakes, including the corn snake, garter snake, rattlesnake, and the fur de lance. The serpent aspect of Quetzalcoatl is shared by other Azteca gods and goddesses, including Xiahuatl, the fire serpent, and Mishquatl, the cloud serpent. Serpents featured heavily in Azteca art and architecture. One striking example is a ceremonial object which may have been once worn as a pectoral. Carved from wood and decorated with mosaic tiles made of shell and semi-precious stones, such as turquoise. The pectoral takes the form of a double-headed serpent. Inspired by this object and what we have learnt about the Aztecs, let us now make our own quattle. We're going to make the dragon using an art technique called collage. I'm starting first by making my collage papers. Inspired by the colourful Aztec mosaic pieces, I'm going to paint a number of sheets. And I'm going to also combine colours as well. So, so far I've chosen blue, green, red, yellow and black. While painting the sheets, I thought it might be a great opportunity to practice colours in Nahuatl. I am not a Nahuatl speaker, so please forgive me if my pronunciation is off. But still, I thought it was important to try. And I hope 
that you will join me too. You can make your collage papers as well, or alternatively, use coloured paper. I'm first painting an A4 sheet of paper with black acrylic paint. This sheet of paper is in fact 180 GSM. This means that it is thicker than normal drawing paper and hopefully it will absorb the paint well. As you can see, I'm spreading the paint with a roller. In the Nahuatl, black is taliltik. After putting the black sheet aside, I am now painting a second sheet red. Red is chiltik in Nahuatl. Now combining green, blue and yellow acrylic paint, I am painting a third sheet and this is coming out a beautiful bright green. The colour reminds me a little bit of the feathers of the Quetzal. In Nahuatl, yellow is Gostik. Now I'm combining green and blue to create a more turquoise coloured sheet. Shishoptik is green in Nahuatl. And Dekshopikilapayi is blue. To lighten the colour a little bit, I added dollops of white acrylic paint. In Nahuatl, Ishtak is white. While the sheets are drying, I'm cutting out a template I created for the dragon's body. You can download this template for free from my website. The link is below in the description box. The hardest area of the template to cut out is the dragon's mouth. At this point, young children may need guidance or assistance from an adult. I am now gluing the dragon to the dry black sheet of paper. As you can see, I am not adding glue to the margins and this is because I want to add paper feathers to the dragon towards the end. I want to be able to layer the feathers, slotting them underneath the dragon's body. Now begins what is perhaps the most challenging part of this activity, and that is cutting and gluing the paper mosaic tile. While the technique isn't difficult, we're adding tiles to a large area, and this will take time and patience. If you are a teacher looking to do this activity in class, I suggest that you spread it out over several sessions, or you may even encourage your students to do this as a group activity. Taking the bluish and greenish coloured papers, I'm now cutting strips that are around one centimetre wide. Then I'm cutting the strips into squares and rectangles. You can make the tiles larger or smaller Now that I've created a little mountain of tiles, I'm now gluing them to the dragon. I'm using Mod Podge as the adhesive, but you could also use PVA glue. As you can see, after painting a layer of adhesive in a small area, I am placing the tiles on top of this layer and close together.
As I complete a small section, I paint a layer of adhesive over the top and this helps to seal the mosaic. This activity reminds me a little bit of doing a jigsaw puzzle. If I'm unable to find a tile that is of the right size and shape, I simply cut one to fit. Progress is slow, but as I'm working on the dragon's body, I find myself imagining Aztec artisans creating beautiful mosaic pieces. They must have had not only great skill, but determination, patience and devotion to create such intricate objects. Art takes time, practice and passion. As your children create the dragon, you might also invite them to imagine what it was like to create art with simple tools, but with a great deal of skill in ancient Mesoamerica. Finally, I have made it to the dragon's head. Before tiling the head, I am first going to cut out a dome shape from the red colored paper, and this will represent the dragon's nose. Once I'm happy with its size and shape, I then glue it. Next to highlight the dragon's mouth, I cut small rectangles from the red colored paper. I then glue them around the dragon's mouth. We're almost there. I continue to tile around the dragon's eye and filling in its nose. I have finished tiling the dragon and now I am varnishing it. I am doing this because I want to give the impression that the tiles gleam as if they were semi-precious stones like the ones that the Aztec carved and used in their art. If you don't want to varnish yours, simply skip this step. Finally, I am going to add paper feathers to my dragon. Before tiling the dragon, I made the paper feathers. I cut about one centimeter strips of the brightly colored paper I made and then cut them into long rectangles. I then trim each rectangle, cutting a point at one end. Next, along each long end, I make small cuts in an upward motion. These cuts represent feather bulbs. I then arrange the feathers around the head of the dragon. I slot some of the longer feathers underneath the dragon's body. To hold them in place, I add a little bit of glue on the end that is going underneath the body. As you will notice, I've coloured in the dragon's eye and I've added touches of gold to its body. If you would like to decorate the eye and add a little bit of shimmer to your dragon, you could glue gold foil paper 
or decorate it with gold paint or gel pens. I hope that you've enjoyed this creative adventure, Ancient Explorers. I honestly would love to see what you create, so please share with me. My social media links are in the description box below. Thank you again for joining me, Ancient Explorers. Keep safe and stay well. Until the next time. Ciao.